Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, welcome back to lecture 13 of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. In this lecture, we will study the tools that are needed to apply the theory of a variogram on a given sample data set. When I say that we will apply the theory or mobilize the theory of a variogram, I am including the theory of spatial stationarity that is, when and how can we decide whether or not a given spatial domain is stationary, right? Um, after that, we are also including the idea or the concept of spatial contiguity. What is spatial contiguity and how do we measure it? What is the utility of spatial contiguity? Remember, when data are spatially contiguous, that is to say that values at locations which are spatially proximate or located closer to each other tend to be more similar usually than values at locations that are located farther apart, right? Now this phenomenon which is known as spatial contiguity is useful in spatial prediction. That is to say that, you know, we cannot really measure, uh, you know, uh, values of any random variable. For example, air pollution, right, that is the concentration of air pollutants in space um, uh, or the crime rate in a city, groundwater levels in a region. We can't possibly be going out and sampling every single location, uh, uh, you know, that in a domain of interest. The domain of interest could be a ward in a city, it could be an administrative boundary like a district, a taluk, a village, a, you know, a state, a, a country and so on and so forth. So there are going to be many unsampled locations in space, right? For these unsampled locations, we need to be able to predict the values that remained unsampled, right? So these, uh, these, for these unsampled locations, just because they are not sampled doesn't mean that there is no pollution. Well, there is pollution. And if we talk about, you know, environmental justice, well, people who are located near to, nearer to areas which were not sampled have an equal right to know uh, uh, the, about the quality of air they are breathing than those areas, uh, than those uh, other households or people from whom the air pollution monitoring station was quite nearby. That is, they are nearer to the monitoring location. So spatial prediction is a fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, uh, social scientific exercise, right? Uh, in that, from that perspective, right, which I just pronounced. So spatial contiguity is a concept that, you know, uh, sort of uses stationarity of a given domain and then moves forward to then, you know, sort of provide us predictions at unsampled locations, all right? And then finally, the variogram is a device that comes from the idea of intrinsic stationarity. Another device that, that provides a measure for spatial contiguity apart from the variogram is the covariogram, which directly relates to the idea of second order stationarity, right? Uh, so what we saw in the previous lecture is first we were able to define the variogram and the covariogram in a statistically theoretic sense, right? Um, um, and, you know, uh, we were also sort of able to say that the variogram is a preferred device than the covariogram because it is more general, right? It holds in its definition, holds for far more, uh, you know, general settings than the covariogram. And that goes back to the theory, a uh, theoretical understanding that, uh, you know, uh, 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 Space, uh, second order stationarity uh, 
uh, is strictly contained within the idea of intrinsic stationality, right? So variogram is preferred. It's a theoretically more interesting, more general device for providing a measure of spatial contiguity in data. And once we have this measure, then we can take it forward in, and apply it to spatial prediction and also spatial regression as we will see going forward. But the question is, how do we actually calculate or estimate a variogram device given, uh, you know, a spatial sample data set, right? So the basic quest for lecture 13 is how do we calculate and estimate the variogram, right, for a given sample data set, okay. Now, when I say calculate, calculating a variogram, I am referring to something that we will see today is called as an experimental variogram, okay. When I say estimate, I will be talking about modeled variograms, okay. And variogram itself is a device or measure of spatial contiguity, okay. So this makes pretty clear the scope of lecture 13, okay? All right, so let's move forward. Okay, what you have on the screen here is a textbook representation of a variogram, a covariogram, and a correlogram, okay? First of all, what is a variogram? Let's, let's just do a little recall, a little, little recap of the variogram, right? So a variogram is, is defined as 2 gamma h, where h is a lag vector and it is equal to the expectation of a random, um, random variable realization at location s minus the random variable realization at location, you know, at lag vector separated by the, you know, first location s, okay. If we take this difference, we square it and we take its expectation. This is the theoretical definition of a variogram, right? Now, in this theoretical definition, you know, we always have understood this definition with this figure. So I'm going to just quickly draw this figure here. Uh, you have, you know, location S1, which I'm defining as S, and a location S2, which I'm defining as S plus H, right? The vector from S1 to S2 is called as the spatial lag vector, spatial lag vector H, right? Like I've said earlier many, many times that H encapsulates what both distance, that is how far apart are S1 and S2 from each other, and also a direction from S1 to S2, right? In a spatial data set, both distance and direction are variable, right? We do not have a, you know, convenient situation like a time series where the data are unidirectional and each hop from time period A to time period nearest time period B is equidistant, right? Or the distance between two time periods is exactly the same no matter what, uh, you know, time, uh, 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 you, know, demand, uh, you know, scale or location you're talking about, okay? Okay, so having understood that, uh, the question is how do we bring this definition to a data set? Um, of course, if 2 gamma h is a variogram, we also saw that gamma h would be a semi-variogram. In the textbook definition, what happens is that if I start at location s, and start moving from S to S plus H, which is separated by this lag vector H, right? What happens is that this device provides me a measure of spatial dependence between the two time sample points. 
So if h is very, very small, if it is exactly equal to 0, here in this textbook variogram or textbook semi-variogram, what I see is that we the variogram value is 0 or semi-variogram value is 0, right? And as we move farther away, that is as h increases, the variogram value rises. That means the smaller the variogram value, the higher the spatial dependence. At location S, if I don't move at all and take another sample point at the same time, I'm going to have perfect correlation. I'm going to have perfect correlation, right? Because it's just the correlation of a value by itself, right? No matter how many times I sample this point, right? I'm going to do it, you know, I'm just creating a replica. That's why the correlation is exactly equal to one, right? That is when the variogram value is very small. Right? And as we keep moving forward, you know, the variogram value rises, that means the spatial dependence, you know, falls. And there comes a point when, after which the variogram value will stop rising, that is the point of no correlation. The point of no spatial correlation. This point signifies that if I were to move farther out from S, to a distance which is large enough, let's say h prime from s, I will learn nothing from the value that is realized at, at, at location s for predicting the value at this location s plus h prime, right? I learn nothing. This is the no spatial correlation uh, point, right? This, the, the point at which I, I you know, uh, uh, the height from the x-axis to this, this large-scale no correlation, uh, you know, no spatial correlation point signifies what is called as the SIL. The SIL is nothing but large-scale variation in data. The distance h, which is signified here as range, right, the distance r or when h equals r signifies the range after which there is no spatial dependence in data, okay? So this is a textbook variogram that we have seen earlier. This textbook variogram turns out to be a mirror image, mirror image of a covariogram. What is a covariogram? Well, we saw that as well, a theoretical covariogram is the covariance between z of s, s and z of s plus h, right? So if there is high spatial dependence, the covariogram value is pretty high. If after the, at the point when, you know, spatial dependence dies, the covariance becomes zero. This is exactly what is happening with the mirror image as well, right? So the variogram, although it's a bit unusual from what we, how we sort of study dependence of two different random variables, you know, in traditional statistics, statistics, uh, it is nothing sort of more complicated than a mirror image of the covariance formulation or the covariogram formulation that we are aware of, right? Um, when we come from the covariogram to the correlogram, which is nothing but C of H divided by C of zero, remember this C of zero is nothing, is, is, is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, large scale variation in data, right? It is the large scale variation in data. It basically means that, uh, you know, this is uh, the covariance or the correlation of a, you know, uh, 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 random covariance of a random variable by itself. So covariance C of zero is just covariance Zs by itself, right? This is nothing but the variance of Zs. And for a stationary domain, this is nothing but sigma squared, which is exactly equal to SIL. This is interesting, all right? So uh, the maximum value of a correlogram is one, well, that is the correlation between Zs by itself is one, right? The covariance is not one, but the correlation is exactly one because it's just C0 over C0. 
right when h is equal to 0 okay if you want to sort of get a mathematical relationship between c uh, ch and gamma 2 gamma h well what you are looking at is the following uh, let me use a different ink so that it's clearer so we have 2 gamma h which is nothing but the variance of zs minus zs plus h is equal to the variance of zs plus the variance of zs plus h minus 2 covariance of zs and zs plus h okay now by definition variance of zs is c0 look here right plus again c0 minus 2 c h so what we have is that gamma h is just c0 minus c h so gamma h and c h are inversely proportional that is why they are simply mirror images of each other right so when at the point when uh, you know uh, 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 gamma h is 0 that is point at the origin c h is just c 0 so this height here is c 0 which is exactly same as the height of the cell okay so so this sort of slide this slide gives you a, a very sort of uh, uh, you know uh, you know detailed understanding of what is a variogram what does it really mean how do we interpret a variogram what's the intuition behind it use our understanding of the covariance from traditional statistics or correlation from st traditional statistics i highly encourage that you start with this you you reproduce this slide at least a couple of more times by yourself so that you get a very clear understanding of what a variogram is a theoretical variogram is okay so with that understanding we will now move on to taking a step forward in order to you know uh, defining a variogram for a given sample data set for doing that let's you know uh, recall this idea of local stationarity from exploratory spatial data analysis so remember in case of ESDA right in case of ESDA we plotted the values the bivariate scatter plots of values realized at any given location with their neighbors one step forward and one step backward in different directions you know in directions like uh, you know towards north south or east west or you know both right and the and the and the idea of local stationarity is that these values should be similar to each other because they are you know they are they are they are located so close to each other now this is also the idea of spatial contiguity right so in this bivariate scatter plot if i were to draw a 45 degree a 45 degree line that represents the the area where z of s is exactly equal to z s plus h this is the line at which you know a uh, 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 correlation between z s and z s plus h will be exactly equal to 1 right if all the scatter plot data sets were to lie on this line then it will represent a condition when each data point exactly explains each other data point in its proximity that is fantastic because then i can just sample any one data point and exactly figure what will be the next you know proximate data point to this this observed data point and then keep going one step forward and reconstruct the entire domain without even sampling more than one data point right well that's not going to be the uh, you know that's that, that's an idealistic situation that's not how real data set work data sets work right the real data sets work like what we see for the coal mine data that we learnt earlier what happens with the real world data set is that for any given value any given real world value let's say we work with value 9 so this is z of s equals 9 
For this value, when I go on to sort of, you know, drawing a vertical hash line, it allows me to identify the values of Zs plus h that correspond to this, to this, to this line. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four, five, you know, proximate values to, uh, you know, uh, Zs equals nine. Some of these values are very, very close. Some of these are very close to Zs. They represent very strong spatial dependence. Some of them are quite far apart, you know, quite different. Right, very close meaning not location but similar values. Right, and some of them are quite distinct or uh, you know uh, or different relative to z of s equals nine. Right, it could be in the positive direction or in the negative direction. Irrespective of that, the idea is there is high risk similarity. Right, so on average, however, the data seem quite similar in their locality, right, but not exactly the same. Now, this idea of spatial dependence can then be brought forward to the variogram, right. So, if the look for, so if I had only one z of s, you know, which is a very close value, I expect the variogram value to be small, gamma h to be small, right. And if I have a distinct value from z s equals 9 at s plus h location, right. So, then I expect the gamma h value to be high that is reflecting a uh, lower spatial dependence value, okay. Based on this understanding, let us try and create a, uh, you know, an experimental variogram that is we will calculate a variogram value from the data. To do that, you know, first of all this h scatter plot or this bivariate uh, scatter plot that we have, we have worked with see that it reveals correlation of data over a particular lag vector h. And we know that correlation is coming, is comes from covariance, right. So, c of h is, uh, so no, it should be covariance, sorry about this typo, it's, it, it reveals covariance directly and then correlation can be calculated as a function of covariance or correlogram, right. So, it reveals covariance. And we know from our first slide that covariance and correlation are mathematically and graphically mirror images to each other. They are inversely proportional. That means if I can get the covariance measure CH from the bivariate scatter plot, I should also be able to get the variance measure from this, uh, you know, sorry, the variogram measure from this uh, scatter plot, right? Because we know they are simply linearly related, right? So, the bivariate scatter plot can be a very good starting point. However, remember it is for a given value of h. So, it will provide me a 2 gamma or a gamma value which is at a given lag vector h, okay. Now, given a spatial data set or a sample data sample, the variogram is written as the following. It is equal to, it is given as 2 gamma h which is by definition the variogram is equal to 1 over some value, right, number of observations, which is denoted as modulus n in h. Summation i goes from 1 to n h. Summation of first difference squared values of, look of, 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 you know, realizations at location s and location s plus h. This value n, capital N h is a set, this is a set notation and it says it contains elements i comma j in pairs. So, it contains pairs of elements such that they are separated by the lag vector h. So, the set n of h contains all data pairs in our sample, right, all data pairs, all unique data pairs in our sample that are, you know, separated by 
lag or let us say spatial lag h right and the modulus value of h this modulus of h is nothing but a notation a notation for the count of unique uh, elements in set n h. So, n h is something like a neighborhood data set, it is a neighborhood set not data set, it is a neighborhood set. So, I am going to define it as a neighborhood set. right so it 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 sort of collects the pairs of neighbors that are separated by a lag h right neighborhood set for the spatial lag h now let's look at the data based definition of 2 gamma h and the theoretical definition of 2 gamma h and try to figure out the correspondence between the two. The theoretical definition was expectation z of s minus z of s minus h squared uh, that is it right. So, this expectation of the first you know uh, uh, sorry the difference squared. So, it is a mean squared uh, value of uh, you know values at spatial lag h in my given the given data set. The expectation operator has been replaced by 1 over n summation of these you know uh, difference squared entities that is about it. So, we are looking at the sample representation of, of our variogram. Okay? So, next after learning this we are going to go through the process of actually calculating this variogram given the above formula, right. I am going to write down the formula here again. So, 2 gamma h is 1 over number of unique elements in the neighborhood h, uh, neighborhood set for lag h. Summation i equals 1 to n of h. So, we sum through all the elements that is all the pairs of, of, of locations that are separated by spatial lag h. Summation of the, of the difference of s i from s i plus h squared. So, I have a representation of a mean squared difference okay, of a mean squared difference. In order to do that, in order to make our lives easy, what we do is we sort of you know the starting point is uh, you know called as the tail and the and the and the and the point that is separated by this tail that is the starting point the initial point by a lag vector h is denoted as a head right so we are starting at s1 and we are going to s2 where s2 is nothing but s1 plus h again h is encapsulating both the distance as well as the direction. For the given example, what you see here is that you have a h value, let us say it's equal, it equals 10, right. So, you take this tail and head representation and you collect the pair where you have z s i and z s plus 10. The colors on your you know on this regular lattice are basically representing you know data uh, you know uh, data intense data values right. So, they are just digital numbers that are now embedded as a color scheme right. So, you can you can you can note these values you can take the first difference and you can, you know, then you can square it that square enters you know right here. So, this is s plus 10 and this is s ok. Now, just like you sort of take this device which goes from the tail to head, what you do is you take it around to every possible pair in this data set. Okay? So, what you do is 
As a second step, you're going to take it uh, onto the next, you know, cell on the right, and you're going to collect the pair, you know, uh, k comma l. So you can say this is z s k, and this is z s k plus ten. Right? The previous previous one was i. So you will keep, you will take this device and you will run it through every possible, you know, uh, sample pairs that are separated by lag vector h. Using the, those, these unique values, you will collect them in a set which will be, which will be called as the set n h, right. So we can collect all these pairs that are separated by, you know, uh, by the lag vector h, you can imagine it will be, there will be very many uh, such, uh, you know, pairs. For these pairs, we will define the lag vector, uh, the, the, the neighborhood set n h, and with these data and the set uh, definition, we can evaluate the experimental variogram 2 gamma for a given value of h. See that we are only looking at one h value in one direction. I can take the same h value and change the direction from east to west or west to east rather to north to south. That is to say that I could take the same vector and go downward from north to south and collect another, you know, uh, a sample of, 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 of uh, location pairs that are separated by the lag vector h. Now, Although h represents the same distance, h equals 10, but in a different direction. And also nobody is actually stopping me from, act, from, from, going, from going diagonally in, in the sense of direction. So you can imagine that you will have many, many values of h and many, many values of, uh, you know, uh, in the sense of direction. Similarly, I could make my h value smaller instead of 10. I could be working with, you know, h equals 5. So then I will have many more sample pairs in these data. I could also, you know, equivalently work with a very large value of h. Then you can imagine that my set n h with a large value of h, let's say h equals 20, will have a lower number of entities than for n of H. So for this regular lattice, I can actually, I can actually claim that the count of, you know, elements or unique pairs that are separated by a lag of h, h tilde, is going to be smaller than the count with lag vector h if, you know, h tilde is greater than h. And on the other hand, this count will become larger if the lag vector sort of, I am going to look at the value, not the direction, if h tilde is less than h, right. I hope this is clear. This is just to make things clear. We are not going to use these uh, things uh, going forward, okay. So this is for a regular lattice. But what if? we have an irregular lattice and in fact, when we work with data, we usually have to work with irregular lattices, all right. So now going forward in the next, uh, you know, part of this, this lecture, we are going to study how to calculate a variogram if the data are a irregular lattice, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.